We're back. We're live. It's the 11 o'clock block here on ThinkTech, and we're doing um, Global Connections with Carlos Suarez in uh, the University of the Americas Puebla in Mexico, 50 miles. I get this right now, Carlos, 50 miles east of Mexico City. Carlos, say hello to the people. Aloha. Hello, and welcome. Joining you here from Puebla, Mexico. Yeah, great to have you on the show. And Gene Fidel, my brother, uh, fresh from Yale. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs> and today we're going to talk about uh, Brexit and its international implications. Things are not going well for Theresa May. So Carlos, why don't you lead off? You had a bunch of slides. Why don't we, why don't we hear from you on that? Yeah, thank you, Jay. You know, of course, we're facing a very critical moment now in the issue of, of UK and its decision to exit or divorce itself from the European Union. So I just wanted to share maybe a, a quick overview and, and provide some of the context. What is uh, this? Uh, Brexit issue, what is the EU for that matter. We can go first to the first of uh, 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 the number one that I have here. It's a little it's a brief chart that describes this thing, the European Union, of course. It is a, a, a political and economic union of 28 countries uh, bringing together a partnership, a unique partnership that's been in the work for many, many decades. Uh, really, it, 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 uh, its origins begin in the 1950s. But the UK, what we know today is the EU uh, is formalized uh, in the early 90s, 93, uh, by the Treaty uh, of Maastricht. However, uh, again, it, before that, it was evolving. And, and, and for our purposes, we're going to talk about the United Kingdom. They actually joined what was then known as the European Economic Community, the EEC, in 1973. Uh, they were not the founders. Uh, those were a, a smaller subset of six countries, uh, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, France, Germany, and Italy. But the UK was joined in the 70s uh, rather reluctantly and, and with a lot of skepticism, because that, that becomes relevant when we look at their crisis today. But what is the EU again? It brings together these countries that are all democratic, uh, obviously promoting peace and prosperity and freedom, uh, about 500 million uh, citizens of the EU. And this is the very first time that one of the member states has decided it wants to exit. Uh, and so the so-called Brexit refers specifically to uh, uh, a referendum held in June of 2016 in the UK uh, that barely passed, but it had a majority uh, to decide to exit. Uh, and over the last two and a half years, almost three years now, but especially the last two years, they have been negotiating with the EU officials uh, to figure out you know, what kind of deal they could arrange, what would be the future relationship. Uh, well, uh, let me turn to number two. I have a map of the European Union itself that just shows uh, the 28 member states, uh, and it also briefly shows their years of accession. So it started with six, and then nine, and then 12, uh, with the UK joining in, in what I mentioned, 1973. Um, and so this map uh, just gives you a sense. It is most of Europe. There are a few exceptions like uh, uh, Switzerland and Norway that are not members. But for the most part, it, it brings together most today of Western and Eastern Europe, Northern Europe, you know, and you know, the Southern Europe as well. Um, let me move uh, very quickly. I'm going to go through a lot of these slides just to give us this context. Number three uh, illustrates what we would call the Schengen. Uh, Schengen refers to a treaty also that basically provides for the borders uh, of the outer borders of the European Union that allow for the free movement of people within those borders. So today, when you're crossing from France to Germany or Spain to, you know, France, uh, basically it's like going from uh, a U.S. state to Oregon. There are no borders and checkpoints, uh, free movement of people and goods. However, uh, that has been a source of some tension and the rise of a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment. And in the case of Britain, uh, the U.K., uh, a desire to want to control some of uh, uh, who gets into the country uh, so this Schengen just illustrates again, it is a concept of the free movement of people, et cetera. Uh, let me move again now just to get us to have more of a discussion. I want to show another map, number four. It is a map of the United Kingdom itself. Uh, we have to understand it is uh, uh, a collection of uh, basically four countries, uh, if you will. Uh, you've got the England, uh, the dominant uh, main power. You have Scotland to the north, Wales uh, on the western side of the island, and then across a piece of the other island, which is Northern Ireland, and that we'll come back to because that's one of the sticking points today about their decision to exit because the other majority of that island is the Republic of Ireland, a separate country, and also a member of the EU. Um, finally, let's move on again just to give us a little more of the context of the number five uh, 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 graphic I have is a map that illustrates the Brexit referendum uh, and the results that were held in June of 2015. And again, it did pass as a majority, and it surprised many. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a big shock, if you will, because 
it was uneven, and, and by that I mean it was at some level a generational difference. The younger population uh, voted mostly to remain and did not want to exit, uh, but also more rural areas, of, particularly of England, because as that map will show you, uh, you know, the results in Scotland, for example, and in parts of Wales, and even in London, were against Brexit. They, they preferred to remain, uh, but uh, the majority prevailed, and so uh, the results uh, uh, were in favor of Brexiting uh, or exiting the UK. Um, finally, uh, let me move very, very quickly to number six, because this is where we see one of the sticking points, and, and we'll talk about this a little more, you know, what is this Brexit, uh, the exit. Uh, one of the sticking points has been the question of this border between Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK, and the Republic of Ireland, which is a separate country. Uh, and you know, with the UK deciding to leave, uh, there is a, you know, the, uh, no longer being part of the, the customs union of the single market. What does that mean? Would, would they have to, you know, for example, put up customs checkpoints, uh, borders? And uh, this is a, some of us will know the story. Uh, beginning in the late 60s and all the way until 1998, uh, this is a, a region that experienced a lot of violence, sectarian violence between uh, you know, different groups, uh, and, and it took uh, a lot of negotiating, and in 1998 they reached uh, the nor uh, uh, basically a set of uh, accords that um, basically you know, solved and, and addressed a, a peace agreement, uh, and today those borders are open. But what's going to happen after the EU leaves? That's kind of the sticking point, and again, I'll, I'll come back to this later. Uh, lastly, and this will allow us to now move to just talk more about this, I, I have a picture, number seven, that just shows Theresa May, the Prime Minister, who came to office shortly after the Brexit referendum in 2016, uh, because after that result, the then Prime Minister, David Cameron, who had supported remaining in the EU, uh, he basically lost uh, the confidence and lost his seat and stepped down to be replaced by Theresa May. And she has been negotiating this exit. Uh, it hasn't gone well. She's in a deep crisis now uh, and uh, just returned, you know, a couple of days ago from meetings with the EU officials to try to offer another deal. And just we saw the results today. It was rejected uh, yesterday again. And, uh, and so they do not have a deal and they, they don't know exactly how they're going to exit. Uh, and here we are with a crisis just a couple of weeks away from the date that was set for them to depart, 29 March. Uh, let me stop on that. I want to turn to some of you guys, and, and uh, maybe you guys can take a minute and, and we can follow, uh, continue the dialogue. What, what are the implications, and maybe clarify some other parts of, of what's happening so far. Jim, can you help us with what the crisis is? What are the factors? What are the arguments? What are the constituencies? Well, I think Carlos has laid out the uh, the demographic issues within the UK. Uh, I, I'm, I'm less familiar with uh, the demographic issues uh, on the continent, uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, you know, this whole exercise is like playing Hamlet without Hamlet because uh, uh, Mr. Putin and Russia are an active, uh, maybe too active observer, uh, observer participant in this uh, process. And, and beneficiary. And, and beneficiary of the chaos. But I wanted to make a couple of observations. The, the first is, um, on the domestic side, uh, in terms of the uh, legal institutions of the UK, it, and Carlos, please uh, you know, correct me if you think I've got any of this out of focus, but what we have here is a, a set of stresses <coughs> on a variety of the domestic legal institutions of the UK. For example, this was a decision uh, that reflected, the uh, Brexit decision was uh, reflected the results of a referendum. Well, referendums are uh, not really a regular part of the British constitutional arrangements. Uh, all, you know, Parliament is sovereign according to the unwritten British constitution. So why, why is there a referendum? And, and did the conduct of that referendum undermine a, a, a probably the cornerstone of the, the British uh, legal arrangements. So that's one observation. The second observation is the British courts have gotten involved. There was litigation over whether Parliament, uh, the referendum having occurred, uh, could continue to play a role. And that went to the UK Supreme Court, a relatively new body, although its roots are in the uh, centuries old House of Lords. So that's, that's another one. Uh, my, my own sense is that what you're seeing here is uh, one of those cataclysmic events that occurs roughly every hundred years in the UK. Uh, the first one that comes to mind, well, uh, I'll start with 
Uh, the Union of the Crowns of Scotland and England. I mean, that was 1600-something. Uh, that, you know, created uh, the, the, the uh, current uh, basic arrangements. Uh, a century later, um, there was the Act of, uh, the Act of Settlement, and uh, uh, it became the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. Uh, a, a century plus later, in about 1832, there was reform of Parliament. Parliament had been filled with rotten boroughs that were uh, run by the major landowners and noble families. Uh, about 80 years after that, I think the year is 1911, something like that, where the, uh, the House of Lords lost its power, lost its power to do anything more than really slow down legislation. Uh, and then, and then we have this controversy. So they're roughly hundred-year intervals. Uh, uh, you know, maybe it's like sunspots, but but this may be the mother of all uh, challenges to the uh, basic British constitutional arrangements. Mm. Well, I think you, you provided some good uh, context. It's fascinating because uh, traditionally, for many years, we look at the British uh, uh, or the UK their system of government, the Westminster model of, of parliamentary democracy. It's very stable, very orderly. It's, long, you know, been looked at that way in, in the field of comparative politics. Today, it's in deep crisis and, and uh, chaos and, and, you know, the, the weakness that we see of the current administration there. Uh, but I want to just maybe add a little bit of what you mentioned, though, is that, you know, given this, what's interesting, when this referendum took place, which, as you know, it's not a regular, you know, affair for the you know, system of government there, um, it, it was also one that, uh, you know, I think increasingly we may find out more in time, but you know, was there involvement from outside forces and the use of social media to sort of manipulate public opinion? And I'm specifically thinking about whether there was Russia uh, involved, because we know that they've been involved in the U.S. and in other places as well. Uh, but certainly it is creating a, a serious crisis of, of, of not just for the U.K., which um, uh, the implications are it could have a downturn of the economy and just a polarization of the political environment, but even for the European Union, because uh, here for many years it, it has been, you know, moving forward, expanding and, and deepening so that uh, today the, the citizens of any of these countries, they are governed more by EU laws and EU rules. And of course, that's one of the, the reasons that, that was pushed by for, for the, those seeking the Brexit, that uh, they wanted to have less control from Brussels, from the EU, and more control more, of, you know, over their own, uh, let's say, rules and, and sovereignty. So a lot of it is driven by that. Uh, but uh, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, a, at the moment, a real crisis for the UK, but also for the EU, because they don't want to, to see this, and they don't want to make it easy for the UK so that others could potentially follow suit and, and see, you know, the mm. from Poland or Hungary or some other country. So uh, the process is one that requires a lot of negotiation. For the UK to leave, they're going to have to pay a big fat bill. I think I've seen figures 35 to 40 billion US dollars, the equivalent basically as, you know, commitments that they have, obligations they have to make. Uh, and then the real, you know, sticklers are including what economic relationship with, will the UK have? Will it be completely out or will it be somehow a, some form of arrangement where we'll have access to some of the market? And there are different views in, in the different camps about this. But let me finish by saying also that it's not such a neat, you know, we have the Brexiteers that favor exiting and we have the Remain side, but it's not so black and white in the sense that there are some who favor a very hard line, you know, maybe hard Brexit, complete separation. There are others who would like it to be a more softer version where there might be a relationship that stays and it's not so deep, but that doesn't satisfy others. There are still some who would argue today they would like to have another referendum to somehow revisit the whole question because they, you know, today we see the, the chaos that has engendered, uh, and for many people who voted, maybe that they would rethink it. And one scenario that could it all be reversed? They just go back to where they were. Uh, I'm not sure that's in the cards at the moment, but it, of the many options that might still be on the table, that is still there. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. This is this concept of the referendum that hasn't been the norm in, in, in the British system. But here we have it today, and, and a lot of a lot of uncertainty, a lot of chaos. So uh, it's Sheen again, Carlos. Um, the yeah. thinking about the referendum. Uh, a, a couple of uh, months ago, I was in England, and uh, I had uh, dinner with two members of the House of Lords. Uh, I'm not going to identify mm -hmm. them, you know, private conversation. But I asked them. Uh, you know, w where they thought the path led and uh, what would happen if there, was, if there were another referendum. 
And as of a few months ago, these two uh, legislators, their life peers, and not their hereditaries, uh, yeah. thought that the, the result would be the same. That, that uh, uh -huh. Brexit would, would uh, uh, you know, uh, be approved yet again. Do you have any more recent information? And more to the point, what are the, what are the uh, betting, uh, the, bet, the, the uh, lab brokes, you know, the people who give odds on these things saying? <laughs> yeah. You know, I haven't I haven't seen a lot of detail on that, but but my sense is that again, you know, you're talking about two, you know, members of the elite uh, House of Lords, and you know, do they represent the, the society at large? Well, my sense is that maybe speaking more for maybe the, the younger generation. I'm, I'm more in contact. I've had students here from the UK, and and for them, it was a really a dismay uh, of an uh, oh, well, it was a, a, an outcome that they were quite dismayed to, to learn because, of course, the younger generation are more mobile. They have opportunities study and you know, work in, in continental Europe in ways that uh, a change of that or exit from the UK, uh, European Union will, will obviously jeopardize. Um, but you know, it's one of those things, uh, as we look back at that referendum, uh, it was a rather quick process and it was one that uh, the campaign itself, you know, for those who promoted Brexit, it was presented as a pretty straightforward and easy process and somehow it wouldn't have the kind of cost that we are now seeing it will have. Uh, so I don't know. I, I'm, I don't have a, a, a control. You know, I don't want to speculate or even guess, and, and I haven't seen evidence of it. But uh, certainly today, there are some who are going to say, "Gosh, you know, we didn't realize this was either this messy or complicated, or that the potential was that it might go worse." Uh, so uh, let, let me let me let me interrupt yeah, with yeah, with a question. Uh, sure. So yeah. uh, Mrs. May has repeatedly gone to Brussels to uh, put one. Uh, reframing after another of uh, her negotiating position in front of the uh, authorities of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the European the Union, EU, yes, of and uh, she uh, continues to come home empty-handed. Now, my question is, mm -hmm. uh, and I have a, a hunch about. That. I'll tell you what my hunch is after I give the question. The question is. Uh, are, uh, to be a little colloquial, are, are the uh, uh, authorities in Europe jerking her around, or are they making, are they saying, uh, you know, you haven't really presented anything new? In other words, in this kind of kabuki, is it, is it kabuki on both sides? Uh, is she going there uh, just to show that she's give, given it, uh, you know, her best efforts? Uh, are the, or alternatively, are the people on the European side, the European Union side, uh, uh, putting up uh, objections in hopes that Brexit crumbles and that, in fact, uh, Britain will stay in? Mm. I mean, who who is kidding whom here? Mm. Yeah, yeah. What a great that's question. A question uh, and that's a great question. Is, uh, Carlos, I'm going to give you one minute to think about the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think you deserve a minute for that. And then we'll come back and we'll sure. discuss this further. We'll take a short break. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go beyond the lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that you know may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. Our flagship energy show among the six energy shows we have is Hawaii, the state of clean energy. It plays every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Come around and see us. Learn about energy. Keep current on energy on thinktechhawaii.com. Okay, we're back with Carlos Suarez uh, in the University of the Americas, Puebla, and my brother Gene Fidel from Yale talking about Brexit. And as we left it, there was an important question hanging, and Carlos was going to take a minute to think about it. What, so what is your response, Carlos? 
Yeah, well, you know, it, 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 it's not such a quick and easy answer. Let me say that on one hand, for, you know, the perspective from the European Union, um, are they jerking her around or not? I mean, I, I think they want to make sure it's not easy or simple or without pain. In other words, they, they, they do want to be firm. Uh, and if anything, I, I would say uh, the perspective we see is that they're blaming, uh, you know, the, 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 the current, uh, let's say, uh, predicament squarely and directly at the UK and the fact that the Parliament did not decide or rather was never consulted about what kind of Brexit it wanted before the negotiations began. In other words, even though every everyone knew the MPs would have the final say, there really was not a, you know, a clear uh, a debate or discussion that clarified that role. Um, and so uh, on one hand, I, I think it's pretty clear that the European leaders are disappointed with how it's played out, and uh, and, and 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 again that they don't want to make it easy. To, uh, uh, you know, maybe they would. On one hand, there are some who surely would like to see it all just somehow crumble, and then the UK just decide, well, okay, we'll we regret what we did, and we'll just go back to where we were. Because even that outcome is, is one that you know it's just not going to be easy. It, it, you know, it, it presents you know some some heads would have to roll. Uh, I don't know, uh, but I, I have a sense that. From the perspective of the EU, they're saying, look, the onus is on you. If you're going to leave, you've got to decide what are the terms. And I think, regretfully, Theresa May has just not been able to play that role. She hasn't been able to keep uh, some of her own uh, supporters in line. Moreover, it's not a simple, you know, uh, her party supports this and the other party doesn't. There's a real divide even within the parliament. You have many on the labor side who very much are supporting the Brexit, maybe variations of a soft version. Uh, you have, uh, even in the last couple of weeks uh, after the recent uh, crisis, after, I think it was after January, but maybe within the last month, we saw defections from both the Conservative Tory Party and the Labour, a small faction that was creating a separate sort of more independent group that could hold the cards in, in some of this, um, you know. Uh, and so at the moment, just a real chaos and, and uncertainty prevailing in, in, in the British uh, Parliament. Uh, and uh, all the while, Theresa May just looking more and more weak. She goes down there, she visits Brussels or Strasbourg a few days ago, and just comes back empty-handed. Uh, and I think, again, for the Europeans, they're like, hey, you've got to figure this out, and they're, they're holding pretty firm. They, they, they basically want to make sure that they stay unanimous in their agreement, and so they don't have defections among themselves. Uh, and so far, that's been the case. The EU has been Sh pretty firm. Shouldn't Theresa uh, May? Shouldn't Theresa May? Shouldn't Theresa May simply resign? Shouldn't she drop out? And if she did, would that help? Because we have the deadline ahead uh, of us. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it, you know. It, it, I think she's got to say. quit. I think she's got to resign. Uh, this notion that she can survive now two uh, major votes, uh, you know, lose lose two major votes and still. Uh, pretend to be uh, Her Majesty's First Minister, I mean, is crazy, actually. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I think uh, she's doing incalculable damage to uh, yeah. the legitimacy of Parliament. But, uh, but I want to ask you a question, Carlos. Uh, had, do we yeah. have any sense of where the palace stands on this? Uh, you know, yeah, is, I, is, I, there, I, is that a complete black hole? Um, it is for me, and in part because there's, you know, been for many years a tradition where they tend to stay out of, of you know, giving their clear views uh, about this. And so, you know, when you, you mention that, I don't know offhand. I haven't seen a, any kind of real uh, role or, or position or anything. Uh, you know, obviously they're going to have concern about not seeing things fall apart and then the political crisis that exists now. I agree, as you just suggested, Theresa May, I mean, her days are clearly numbered. She's not going to be able to you know, bounce back from this and, and, and gain a lot of support. Uh, but when does she step down? I mean, is it right now to kind of try to cobble, cobble together yet another deal? Uh, the more immediate likelihood and what's the scenario that we're facing with the 29 March deadline is that right now, I understand tomorrow, Thursday, they're expected to have a vote on whether to request an extension or buy a little more time, kick the can down the road. Uh, and again, here again, you know, will that help uh, or is it just buying more time uh, for the same thing, uh, but basically uh, where, when we look into the future here, uh, various scenarios, the worst case that nobody wants, which they rejected today, was no deal, that they exit with no deal because that sends, you know, just everything kind of, it doesn't give them a transition period, it's just, it's a, it's a non-starter for many. 
Uh, are, is there a further vote? We've had that already. Is there a renegotiation? That's been going on to no avail. Is there another referendum? Again, uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of groundswell for that because uh, uh, challenges there. Uh, is there a new election, uh, basically, uh, or a vote of no confidence that brings down the prime minister and kicks in a whole other dynamic? Mm. Uh, or is there a scenario for a no Brexit where they simply reverse it? Uh, again, any of these could what, happen. And, what a mess. Uh, almost anybody's guess. We, we have it, one minute left, Gene. Can you, can you can take a look at uh, trying to wrap this yeah. up? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, so it's a mess. I think uh, what we're looking at is a train wreck. Uh, and yeah. uh, there's going to be a major institutional uh, uh, injury, uh, lasting institutional injury that uh, England is going to feel, the, Britain, the Brits are going to feel for decades. Mm. And how about the U.S.? The U.S. going to feel any of that? We have our own problems. All right. Carlos, last statement. What, do you, what, what would you like to leave people with? What message? Well, just this last point you raised about the U.S., because even in, under the Brexit, there was this idea, and even under Trump's new presidency, that somehow he was going to make better deals and the special relationship with the U.K. I think the crisis that we see now even makes it harder for any prospect of a U.S. Uh, you know, U.K. agreement uh, just because of the chaos and uncertainty that, that's un unhappening here. So it's anybody's guess, but uh, the scenarios don't look good. Many options, all of them pretty tough and bad ones. Crisis, uncertainty, <sighs> chaos. Now, so far, the only winner is Mr. Putin. Well, thank you very much, you. Gene Fidel, Carlos Juarez, for this important discussion on Brexit. I hope we can revisit it soon, and I think everyone should be following it. Aloha, you guys. Bye. Bye.